So as those are, are going out, I'll kind of tell you where we are in our preaching series called Beyond. We've got this, uh, this dirty old door up here and these beautiful old windows to remind us that to go and be on God's mission requires that we wipe off the, the dingy, dirty windows and the spaces that we confine ourselves and get a vision of what God is up to. And to get on board with the Spirit and the mission the Spirit leads us to be a part of, we have to go beyond ourselves, beyond our fears, beyond our insecurities, beyond greed, beyond many of the things that hold us back and keep us inside of a box. And so that's where we are. We're going beyond. The flame reminds us that it's the Holy Spirit that leads us and that we have to focus on God's Spirit in order to accomplish what He's called us to do and to live the life that He's called us to live. Today we're going to talk about the importance of the community called church in helping us accomplish God's mission for the world. I want to start with some stories about some of the characters I've met up along the way. When I was a child, there was, uh, we went to a very historical old United Methodist church that had a choir and very formal uh, before they started their contemporary service. And I would always sit in probably the third or fourth row with my family. And uh, I always loved the, the time that we called special music in the service because the choir would offer up some kind of an anthem. And so there was always this lady in the choir named Betty that I always looked forward to hearing her sing. Uh, she didn't really have solos, though you wouldn't know it because she sang louder by herself than all the other voices combined. And for some reason, the music director always insisted on putting her in front of the microphone that hung down from the ceiling right, right in front of her. And so I think it would be small to say that Betty was a soprano. I think if there's something higher than a soprano, she was probably that. I mean, it was the kind of singing that you would probably want to do in your shower at home uh, when it's just you, but probably not in front of a whole congregation. So I'm going to see if I can do the demonstration. It was, we could be singing some hymn and she'd be going, Whoa! you know, with the big vibrato and everything. And so as a kid, I always loved going to church. You know, there were cool people and I get to see my friends. All that was great. But I really loved seeing what Betty was going to do that week and how loud she was going to sing. And so it was every hymn that we were singing with her, but it was the choral anthem when we were all seated, and she would just belt it out, and I would just sit there and laugh. I probably <laughs> still bear the bruises on my ribs where my mom was elbowing me every single week to stop laughing, and really it was to keep her probably from laughing as well. <laughs> and so I always, I always remember Betty and her voice whenever we sing some of the familiar songs of the church. And then there was uh, the time we moved into my very first pastoral appointment. Rachel and I were unpacking boxes, and this church did a tradition called pounding. That's not where they all come in and beat the pastor up before his first Sunday, although that's what I was afraid it was when they told me, we're going to pound you. Oh, great. I didn't, I didn't wear my pads. This is horrible. Should I have boxing gloves? Uh, but what it meant is ye olden days, uh, back in the earlier days of the church, church members would bring the new pastor a pound of flour, a pound of sugar, stuff to help you stock your pantry when you've moved into town and are without those things. It's evolved a little bit. Now people bring canned goods and, and they bring uh, muffin mixes and the kinds of things that we'd actually use. I'd love to be pounded by Bluebell ice cream. That would be incredible. Uh, but I, I still haven't, haven't ever done that before. So we were unpacking boxes, trying to get ready for my first Sunday and get settled in. And uh, somebody came and knocked at the back door. We opened it up and there were two lovely ladies in their 80s bearing bags of stuff they just bought for us at the grocery store. It was so, so sweet. And so we invited them in, and I take the bags from them and go to set them on the counter. And as I turn around to do so, I hear one of the ladies say to the other, he's going to be real easy on the eyes in the pulpit every Sunday. <laughs> and I look at Rachel, who also has her back to these two, and we just are, you know, I'm thinking about my mom elbowing me in the rib cage at that moment. And, and I go, okay, what do I do in this case? Do I say you? They weren't talking to me, they were talking to each other, or do I just pretend I didn't hear them? I'd never been so embarrassed in my whole life, so I just, I, I thanked them for coming, said it was nice to meet them, and kind of shoot them out the door, because it was awkward at that point. Uh, and so I'll never forget my introduction to that church. When I came for my interview, consequently, about a month before in that place, I was in a rental car, and this lady met me on the street, and stuck her hand out the window, and started waving. And I thought, oh, what does she want? So I rolled down the window, and she said, you must be the new Methodist pastor. I said, I am. How did you know? I mean, I hadn't even started my first day. I was just there for my interview. She said, well, we know what every car everybody drives here in town is, and your car was funny, so I figured that was you. 
<laughs> so these characters that we meet along the way. And then there was, there was this other, other church that we served where they used to have the biggest choir in town. And this was their, their whole deal. And so when they heard that Rachel and I sang, my wife and I, uh, they said, you have to sing in the choir. It was almost a requirement, no pun intended. That's a bad dad joke, Michael, I, no pun intended. Um, and so anyway, they heard that we sang, and so we began to get involved. Now, this was the kind of choir, it was very formal. They put on the old black robes that smelled like mothballs. Uh, they had us process in from the back of the church when you sang the first hymn every week, up the stairs into the choir loft that used to be full, but now is a little emptier. Well, one day, unbeknownst to us, apparently uh, Rachel didn't know an unspoken rule. Uh, right before she is going to process in with the choir, one of the ladies looks down at her feet and goes, Oh, you're not wearing black shoes. Am I supposed to wear black shoes? Mm -hmm. Choir rule says you wear black shoes under your choir robe. Nobody ever told her the rule. And this is, we've already started the service. I'd already said my first words. And so she's walking in singing, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, or something like that, thinking, I did not wear my black shoes. It's hilarious. One more story, and then we're moving on. Uh, and then there was the, the church that I served. Our piano player was a volunteer, and he led the choir, but he could sing just like Elvis. So every time he sang a solo in church, it was, oh, <laughs> kind of Elvis style. And he would go and take members of the choir to, to nursing homes, and he would sometimes dress like Elvis and do the whole, like, oh, thing <laughs> like that. And it was, I mean, I tell you, Church is so special because it brings together these characters that would never have met otherwise and makes them a community, a community of friends, a community of people who care for each other and love for each other. I have such great memories of all of these folks, even though they did the funniest things and the most random things. It made church a fun place to be a part of. It made me want to go every week. It made me excited about being in relationship with people and learning more about God and has enriched my life greatly. Today, we've been digging through the book of Acts, and it's been about mission outward. But today, we're going to pause and, and take a turn at what mission looks like toward one another in the body of Christ. We're going to look at Acts chapter 4, verse 32 through chapter 5, verse 11. I'd love for you to follow along if you've got your Bibles. I'm going to warn you, the end of this story is a little, uh, little gruesome, so just be ready. Listen now for a word from God. All the believers were, in, uh, were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them brought the money from the sales and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. Now a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. And with his wife's full knowledge, he kept back a part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and kept for yourself some of the money you have received for the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied just to human beings, but to God. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. And great fear seized all who had heard what had happened. And then some young men came forward, wrapped up his body, and carried him out and buried him. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Peter asked her, tell me, is this the price you and Ananias got for the land? Yes, she said, this is the price. Peter said to her, how could you conspire to test the spirit of the Lord? Listen, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out also. At that moment, she fell down at his feet and died. Then the young men came in, finding her dead, carried her out, and buried her beside her husband. Great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. This is God's word for us today. Thanks be to God. All right, so the moral of the story is, if you don't put everything that you have 
in the, the offering baskets, you will die. <laughs> I'm just kidding, just kidding. So, so we take a shift today, right? This is a really weird, awkward story. Everybody was seized with fear. These two people just dropped dead. And I'm thinking, Man, well, Peter, what made you this conduit of, of death, like this Grim Reaper kind of character? This is weird. But it's a story about how much the sharing of possessions and full faith and trust in God mattered in the life of the early church and matters for us today. At the same time the Spirit calls us into mission to our community, it also brings us together as a community. And the strength of our fellowship and faith in God with one another preaches to those outside who are looking at us to see what it looks like to live a life of faith. I think that's what the story is really and truly all about. And so here we are. Uh, it starts out right before this passage begins. We ended here last week. The disciples gathered together with the church and they pray. And part of their prayer was that God would use them to perform signs and wonders so others would see the power of Christ at work through them. Today we see this fulfilled. Now the signs and wonders weren't the healing of the sick. We'll certainly see that in the book of Acts. And these signs and wonders weren't casting out demons, though we'll certainly see that too. And they certainly weren't uh, dealing with the heavy congestion on I-45 through Webster, although that would be really great if we saw some of those signs and wonders as well. The signs and wonders that are proclaimed here are that all of the believers were together and were of one heart and mind. Doesn't sound as miraculous as healing the sick, right? But how incredibly miraculous is it when people can come together and share one heart and mind, be united spiritually that's a really, really big deal. And Luke tells us not only that, but people from time to time would sell all that they had, sell their houses and sell their fields and come and lay the proceeds at the apostles' feet. That is to give it to the church and then they would trust the church to distribute it to whoever had need. And it says that the grace of God was working so powerfully through them, get this, that there was no poor among them that everybody had exactly what it was that they needed. And so you see those who had a lot of resources selling their resources and those who didn't have none benefiting from the sharing of resources and all of the people were of one heart and mind. This is so foreign to the world that we live in today, isn't it? Because our world, not, not outwardly, but it just seems to communicate to us that you're successful when you have stuff of your own. And we all buy, I was thinking about this the other day with appliances, right? How many of you own a blender, right? Yeah, that, look at all the blenders that the blender people get to sell because we all have our own blender. I mean, holding private property of our own is advantageous for the world at large. And so the world's going to keep the systems going that perpetuate the success of the systems. But here we have this teaching that says they sold everything and held all things in common, and there was not one needy person among them. I wonder what that would look like if we practiced that today. I don't know where they lived. <laughs> that part's not really in the scripture, but, um, but they trusted that God was going to provide for them, and they trusted that the resources that they had came from God first. They tell two stories, and I want to show you this. The story of Barnabas contrasts with the story of Ananias and Sapphira to show what it was like to live in trust of God in this resurrection life and what it was like to live with this mindset of scarcity to not fully trust in God and not fully trust in the community and kind of keep themselves isolated from it. The first brings life to the person. The second brings death to the person. So Luke tells us this story about a man named Barnabas who's a Levite. Uh, he's one of the, the people of Israel, one of these people that uh, had a special place in the, the work of the temple. Uh, he had a field, and he sold the field, and he gave all of the money to the church to be distributed to those in need. And he's called Son of Encouragement. He was the, the prototype, really, the one that we all look to, to the way the church was supposed to operate. And then there's Ananias and Sapphira. They also had a field, which they also sold. Now, they had vowed as part of the community, when they sold a field or a house, they were going to give everything to the church. That's the promise that they had made. But instead, they went, you know what? The church will never know if we don't give all of the proceeds from the sale like we had vowed to do. And so let's just keep back a portion for ourselves. We'll call it our rainy day fund. So if this whole Jesus thing doesn't work out, 
if this whole faith in God thing doesn't work out, then we'll be okay. We'll have enough left uh, to live on, and we won't have to worry about anything. And so they agreed together to do that, and so they sold the field, and Ananias comes in, and he lays the proceeds at the disciples' feet and says, this is the full price we received for the field. Okay, so not only did they break a vow that they had made to God and the church, but they also lied overtly about what was going on. This story points back to a couple of stories in the Old Testament where there was conspiracy over the sale of land, where people held back for themselves what they had promised to God already, where the penalty was death. The moral of the story, I think, is that when we truly trust in God, when we truly trust in Jesus' resurrecting power, and we truly believe that this is uh, for us here in this life and not for just this uh, by and by, pie in the sky kind of thing, then it changes our lives today, right now. And we have to put our full faith and trust in it. To choose resurrection is to choose life. To choose greed and to choose self-centeredness and self-sufficiency is to choose death. That's the end. And so this story teaches us two sides of the same coin. And we have to know something about Luke. Luke believed that, that there was a spiritual unity here. And Luke wrote Acts, right? So we can go back to his gospel to see what else he, he said about the topic of money and generosity. But Luke believed that a spiritual unity also spilled over into the physical and financial realms. We have to get this, that when we give our lives to Christ, our lives look different to the rest of the world. The way that we view our stuff, the way that we use our money, the way that we spend our time, all of that changes in the blink of an eye. I mean, this is Luke the, the last time he talked about, uh, the, 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 when he, he looked at Ananias and Sapphira, rather, he looked at them and said, Satan has entered you. The last time Luke said that was when Judas betrayed Jesus to death for a sum of money. It's the same thing. He says that this, this is not right. That's what that message is. This is Luke who told the parable of the man who had an abundant harvest, so much so that he didn't have room to store it all up. And so he tears down his barns, builds bigger ones, keeps everything for himself and says, all right, I'm 35, I can retire, eat, drink, and be merry. And he says that, you fool, tonight your life's going to be demanded of you. Who will inherit all of this stuff that you've stored up for yourself? Luke says the way that we use our possessions and our stuff really and truly matters. I say it this way. The Barnabases of the world who share freely out of what they have been given create healthy communities of faith, healthy churches that make a difference in the lives of those who come and those who are not yet a part of it. Think about this church, for example. Everybody is welcome. Every single person. It doesn't matter where you live, how much money you make, what you've done in your past. Everybody is welcome to come and to be one family. Those who sing like Elvis and those who really shouldn't take their singing out of the shower can come together and be one people, ah, you know, and it works. We become one family and our lives are enriched because of it. There's no other organization on the planet that is like this. We're a community that brings all children together, no matter what their family situation looks like, and teaches them how much Jesus loves them. We're a community of faith that ministers to every single marriage, whether it's healthy or struggling, and says, we care about you so much that we want you to have a strong marriage. How can we help you? We're a community that says, we don't just, it's not about giving to the church, it's about finding freedom in your financial life, and so we want to provide ways to help you get to a healthier state financially so you don't feel that burden. You feel this church when it's healthy, when there's Barnabases among us who give freely to the fellowship, everybody benefits and we're all stronger because of it. But when we act like Ananias and Sapphira and we keep a little bit back and we don't give God what we could give, then the church suffers. Let me tell you a story. One of the places that I've been pastor, uh, we had a problem. Uh, it was a three-story building that had a basement. And every time we had a really hard rain, the basement would flood. Now, this wasn't just the kind of basement that we Texans think of. I wish I had a basement because I'd store all my extra stuff down there, right? I mean, basements were functional in this part of the country. And so it had our kitchen, our fellowship hall, our youth room. I mean, this was the gathering space for the whole church when we came together. And so every time there was a hard rain, I would go down there reluctantly and go, okay, how much water are we going to have to clean up this time? And so I'd assess the damage, and then I'd get on the phone and call the phone tree. And I have to admit that this was always in vain because I knew it was going to be the same four people every time. 
uh, that made themselves available to do this. It was Rachel, my wife. It was our trustees chair, our treasurer, and me. And we would spend three hours, three and a half hours with little shop vacs, anything that we could get to sop up water and vacuum it up and dry the floor until it was all gone. Now, if the church didn't have the money, which it didn't in its treasury, uh, that would be one thing. We barely made our operating budget. We always paid our bills, so we, that, that all was good. We made our budget every year, but we didn't have any extra. But the thing was, there was enough money among the people who attended that church to where this didn't need to be a problem anymore. You may ask, why are you telling a story about a flooded basement? Have you ever been in damp basements that seem to hold water? They smell really bad. And when that becomes your fellowship hall, your youth room, and your kitchen, that's the place where you invite people from the community in to be a part of celebrations in your church. That's the place where Vacation Bible School gathers for meals. This is the place where you assemble for funeral meals. All of a sudden, it doesn't smell like you care much about the house of God. It doesn't show that faith is a priority to the people in the church. And that's not the kind of church people want to be a part of. That church declined over the years because they weren't giving generously to keep up the property that God had entrusted them with. And all things pointed to death instead of life. You see how this story begins to take legs? Healthy churches are made healthy by the generosity of the people sitting in the pews. That's why I'm so thankful to be a part of the watershed. Look at this beautiful facility. We, we live this out. We have, this is our shared property. You've given so that we can have this space. But the goal isn't this space alone. This, this space enables us to do ministry for children and for families. It enables us to do vacation Bible school and, and, and to have a staff that's accessible for our community to gather and connect with us during the week. You have made that all happen because of your generosity. Everything over and above the operating budget goes out in ministry and mission to the community. But we're at a place in our church where we've grown so fast that, that we're not meeting our operating budget. It takes all of us being Barnabases, doing what we can, even if it's just starting with $5 a month or $20 a month to make it all happen. A church is only as healthy as the generosity of its people. But, you know, I began to be convicted as I read the scripture this week that, that if churches truly are to be a, a generous place, the church has to make it easy for people to give. And right now, we're, we're not all that easy. I mean, you can give on PayPal online. You can go to your own bank and cut a check through your own bank, but we don't currently do bank draft, and, and we don't currently have a system that automatically allows you to give each month. We're going to be working on that in the days ahead. And I'm also thinking, to Ananias and Sapphira in this story probably lived in fear that they weren't going to have enough. And, and that's a situation where the church has to begin to come alongside of people and say, we want you to not be bound by your finances and fear about paying your own bills. We want you to have freedom. And so we're going to launch Financial Peace University in September to help folks. I've been through that course now. Uh, I attended part of a second uh, offering of that. It is a powerful and transformational course that I hope some of us will be able to participate in in the fall. So watch for that to come out. I believe that church should be a place of hope and healing and freedom where we come together for the benefit of each other and for the community. And so let me ask you these questions, all right? What is the way that we give, communicate about our faith in the resurrection of Jesus Christ as a church? How are we doing? Let me ask you this. In your own life, what is the way that you are able to be generous, communicate about your faith in the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Does your generosity show that, that you really believe in the power of resurrection to bring new life here and now, or does it show that you're still bound by the way the world views money and giving and personal property? Are you more like Barnabas or Ananias? Who do you want to be more like? The story really convicted me because it taught me the power of all of us buying into this, this Jesus project, this powerful transformation that comes from giving our lives fully to him. This isn't a story about giving money to the church. It's a story about trusting God. It's a story about not seeing that life as, as scarce, where resources are scarce, but seeing life as abundance, that everything belongs to God. And that if God has taken care of us when he's allowed us to steward the property that's in our care, he's going to take care of us when we share what we have with others. I think that's the story today. May we too be as generous as Barnabas in this story so that others will see our faith and trust in the power of the resurrection and want to give their lives to something greater than themselves. Let's pray.
Heavenly Father, we thank you for this very difficult story that's dropped right down in the middle of this book all about uh, generosity, uh, all about mission, all about going out and, and spreading your word. God, we thank you that word and deed go together, that words aren't just empty, but they're accompanied by action. As James said, faith without works is dead. God, I thank you for each and every person here and for the sacrifices they make to support the church, to be generous with what they've been given. God, I, I just pray that you would empower all of us to be bold in our faith and trust in you, to be not bound by our fear of not having enough money to pay our bills, Lord, but to feel free in our finances to be able to be a generous people. Lord, as we invite our missionaries up here in a moment for you, Amarmi, I pray that they would be able representatives of our church, that they would go out and serve with joyful hearts, people that they've never even met before, and that they would make you proud and serve them. God, we don't want to be a church that just focuses inward. We want to be a church that focuses outward in faith and trust in you. And we want others to see our faith and to place their faith in you as well. So Lord, lead us as we, we strive to be that people. We pray all this in the powerful and mighty name of Jesus Christ, our Savior this time I would invite all of the missionaries